Hello, my name is Nicole Mashburn, and I'm going to record my anatomy lectures for this semester. And here we go. I hope. Okay, so anatomy and physiology, what is it? Anatomy is the study of the structure or how it's made, what it looks like, its shape, its form. When we study anatomy, we can study its gross anatomy or its microscopic anatomy. Get my pen back. There we go. Its gross anatomy or its microscopic anatomy. We can talk about regional anatomy. So I'm drawing my little person here. So like regional, we may talk about the head. That word we use is cephalic. We may talk about a surface, like the integumentary system or the skin. We may talk about systemic anatomy like cardiovascular anatomy, or respiratory anatomy, or renal anatomy. We may talk about the microscopic anatomy, the small stuff. Cytology, cyto means cell, so we may be talking about uh, the cell anatomy. Or histology, which is the study of tissues. We may talk about developmental. We call that embryology. We may, we, we may want to study how an organism grows, what changes. Um, if you think way back to your basic biology from uh, high school, remember when we start out, we have an egg and a sperm. Egg and sperm come together to form a baby, but a lot of steps have to go through that process before that baby is formed and then before that baby becomes an adult. So we study that through developmental and embryology. Now what is physiology? Well, if anatomy is where is it and what is it and, and, the, and what it looks like, Physiology is what it does. It's the function. And uh, how does it work? What does it do? Why does it work? That's physiology. And so in this class, we're going to talk about where is it, what does it look like, and then what does it do? How does it work? Why do we use that? Um, and when we talk about physiology, we usually talk about organ systems. We usually divide it into cardiovascular physiology, renal physiology, things like that. Um, when we talk about A and P, anatomy and physiology, we always put them together. They are inseparable. And form always follows function. Okay? Form follows function. What does that mean? For example, the function of the cardiovascular system, that's your heart and your blood vessels, their job is to transport oxygen and nutrients throughout the body. The form are tubes and vessels. Okay? So in order for blood to go throughout the body, you have tubes or arteries and veins, and you have a heart which works as a pump. So the form follows the function, the function to carry things throughout the body, the form, a system of tubes and a pump. When we talk about anatomy, we have to talk about its organization. And there are just, uh, distinct levels of organization. Okay? We have the chemical level. We talk about the chemical level, we're talking about atoms and molecules. Things like hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, things like water, salts, acids. That's water, sodium chloride, hydrochloric acid. These are the molecules and the atoms that form to make the chemicals. You take a bunch of chemicals, put those together, and you get the cellular level of organization. And uh, cells. You know what a cell is? You've probably seen that before. A cell is just like a blood cell or your tissue, your skin cells, your muscle cells. And they have what are called organelles inside of them. So cells have parts like a nucleus, mitochondria, ribosomes, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, things like that. If you take a bunch of cells, the same type of cell, put them together, it's called a tissue. For example, your muscles, your muscle tissue is made up of a bunch of muscle cells. Your skin or skin tissue is made up a bunch of a bunch of skin cells. You take a bunch of tissues and put those together, you get an organ. And organs are always made up of more than one type of tissue. For example, the heart has muscle tissue. It has nervous tissue. It has to have some kind of input to make it uh, to make it beat. Uh, it has a connective tissue, that's what holds it together. So different kinds of tissues come together to make an organ. Take a bunch of organs, put those together, and you have an organ system. So for example, again, cardiovascular system are the blood vessels and the heart. The urinary system, the kidney and the bladder. Reproductive system, 
the ovaries, the uterus. So several organs come together to make a system. You put a bunch of organ systems together, you get an organism or a person or an animal. So I have a heart cardiovascular system, I have a respiratory system, a renal system, or urinary system, um, reproductive system, integumentary system, all these come together to make me. And they all have to work together. So on your, in your book, you'll see a figure that looks something like this. And you'll have uh, on, on your exam some kind of question that has you uh, basically um, order the, organ, the uh, organization um, based on least to most complex or most complex to least complex, however the question is worded. So you just want to know that there's the chemical level made up of atoms and molecules. These are things like hydrogen, carbon. Molecules are things like water. Uh, the cellular level, so here's a cell, and it's made up of organelles, which are the small parts of a cell. Put these cells together, you get a tissue. Put a bunch of tissues together, you get an organ. Organ. Uh, put a bunch of organs together, you get an organ system. A bunch of organ systems, you get an organism. So just kind of remember, least complex to most complex. Let's talk about some of those organ systems. The first one is the integumentary system, and this is basically your external body covering. Okay, It protects your deep tissues from injury. It also has a metabolic function. It makes vitamin D. It also houses um, receptors like pain, pressure, uh, even some hot and cold receptors. You have sweat glands and oil glands. So when you talk about organ systems, I want you to know which organs or which, you know, what what are the components of the organ system? For example, integumentary, hair, skin, nails. So you want to know the what. So what organs and the function? What do they do? So integumentary, basically protection, some metabolic functions, and some sensory functions. The skeletal system. Its main function is protection and support. Think about where your brain is. Your brain's inside your skull. It's like your brain has its own little helmet. So your brain is protected by the skull. If you didn't have a skeleton, you would be a blob. So the, basically the skeleton is your support, it's your scaffolding. Uh, it supports all your muscles and your organs. Uh, and the functions of it, uh, other than support, uh, actually makes blood cells. You have something called bone marrow inside some of your larger bones, and that's where your blood comes from. It makes red and white blood cells. And it also acts as a bank. It's a storage place. It stores calcium. Calcium storage. And probably for the rest of the semester, instead of writing out calcium, you'll see me write CA, and that means calcium. Skeletal muscle, uh, or muscle, the muscle, muscular system. Uh, movement. Okay? Muscles are for movement. And, uh, not just locomotion or not just to pick up something, not just actual movement that we think of. Different kinds of movement. You have three different types of muscle. You have skeletal muscle. You have smooth muscle. And you have cardiac muscle. So skeletal muscle, that moves bones. <laughs> N-E-S, bones. Uh, and that's how you walk or pick up something. I'm actually talking right now. My jaw's moving. There's a bone there. Uh, smooth muscle. Think of tubes. So you're moving things like blood through your vessels. You're moving things uh, like food through your digestive system. So anywhere you have a tube, you have smooth muscle. Cardiac is the heart. And it's the, uh, it's the muscle that pumps. So it's the pumping muscle. And then that pumps the blood, makes the blood move through those uh, arteries and veins. The other function of the muscular system is, is the production of heat. So when your muscles contract, they generate heat, and that keeps us warm. All right, the nervous system. This is one of your control centers. You basically have two control centers in your body. You have the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system is by far the most important, and it's also the fast-acting one. Okay? It responds immediately, and it can multitask. 
For example, right now I'm talking, I'm looking at the webcam, I'm writing, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm breathing at the same time. I had breakfast, I'm, I'm digesting. My, my brain's in charge of that. So I'm standing here, I'm, I haven't fallen over yet. Uh, so you're listening to me, you're writing, you're trying to comprehend what I'm saying. Um, so your brain is in charge of all that, and it's instantaneous. When I decide to snap my fingers, I think about it, I snap, and it's just it's done just like that, really, really fast. Um, so its job is basically to respond to what's going on, either internally or externally, and send the appropriate response. So for example, right now it's a little cold in here, uh, and so my cold receptors are, tell are sending signals to my brain, my brain's thinking, it's a little cold, and they're sending back a signal to my muscles to shiver, so I kind of warm up a little bit. The other control system is the endocrine system. It's a little bit slower. And it is your uh, pineal gland up in your uh, brain, your pituitary in your brain. You have a whole unit on this in 202, uh, but just kind of um, briefly, pineal has to do with sleep and wake cycle. Uh, your pituitary, has, it's just multi, lots of things going on with the pituitary. Uh, testes and ovaries, you know, reproduction. Thyroid has to do with metabolism. Like I said, you're going to get a whole unit on endocrine. Um, thymus has to do with immunity. Your adrenal gland uh, makes epinephrine or adrenaline. So a lot of times when you're stressed, the adrenal gland will kick in. Your pancreas, blood sugar, like insulin and glucagon. So they regulate sugar, blood sugar. But this is a slow system. Uh, it can react uh, in minutes, uh, like the pancreas. If you eat a big old piece of cake and a lot of sugar goes into your, into your digestive system and absorbed into your blood, your pancreas will kick in and send out some insulin to help lower that blood sugar. Um, but for example, your ovaries, they work on a cyclical monthly cycle. Okay, so it, it may take months you know, 30 days, 28 days for your ovaries to do their hormonal thing. And then that brings me back. Endocrine system works through hormones. Uh, so it can be quick, you know, minutes, seconds, minutes, days, weeks, months, or even years. We have things called growth hormone that are made up in the brain. Those take all the way from when you're born all the way to adolescence, when you reach your, your adult height. So it's a kind of a slow system. Um, again, endocrine uses hormones. The nervous system uses impulses. It's almost like it's a, it's, it's, it basically is electricity. And we'll talk about that as we go on. Electricity. So it's fast. Cardiovascular system. This is just your heart and the blood vessels. And it is, main function is transport. Transport your blood throughout the body. It'll carry oxygen to the body. Uh, and then take carbon dioxide and other uh, waste away from the body, deliver nutrients to the body. So it's just the way we get you know, things out into the periphery of our body. Takes the good stuff to the body, brings the bad stuff, and helps us get rid of it. Uh, lymphatic and immune system. Um, this is kind of two separate systems, but for our purposes, we're gonna kind of put them together because they work together. Um, think about uh, if you have an infection, um, a lot of times you'll get swelling around an area. And that swelling's not blood. That swelling is actually lymph or this like interstitial fluid that's kind of bathes the cells of your body. And so that fluid has to be basically recycled, taken back, and, and processed. So your lymphatic system is basically a way to drain that fluid that bathes your cells. Um, associated with that is the immune component. And so you have things called lymph nodes, which are where some, uh, or a type of white blood cell, basically it's a macrophage. They hang out and they basically eat stuff. So they're the cells that come in and eat the bacteria or whatever it is needs to be dealt with. Um, some other parts or organs involved in immunity are your bone marrow, your thymus, your spleen, things like that. Just kind of know the basics of your lymphatics and immunity. It's a pretty complex topic. We'll go into it more in 202. And you also do it in um, microbiology. 
All right, respiratory system. Uh, the respiratory system, you have your nose, mouth, okay, your pharynx, which is the back of your throat, the larynx, which is your voice box where your vocal cords are, your trachea, which is the tube that takes the air into your lungs. Uh, the trachea then branches into the bronchus, and then those will branch again into bronchioles all throughout your lungs. So that's where, where it is. That's the anatomy. The physiology is for exchange. It allows us to exchange, uh, bring in oxygen, and remove carbon dioxide. Digestive system is basically one long tube goes through your body, starts in the mouth, goes down the esophagus, into the stomach, then the food will go into the small intestine, then the large intestine, then whatever's left, whatever waste product will go out the rectum and through the anus. Um, some associated organs are like the liver, the gallbladder, pancreas, um, some things like that. Those help uh, aid digestion. The function is to allow food to be absorbed, break down food and absorb it into the bloodstream so that we can get uh, nutrients from it. Uh, urinary system, that's your kidneys, your ureters and your bladder. The kidneys basically filter the blood and they remove uh, excess water. They remove waste and they help balance your electrolytes. They, like your salt balance, like sodium chloride, helps to balance your salt. Um, so your blood basically goes through the kidneys where it's filtered out and then whatever, the, by, the byproduct is called urine. The urine goes down the ureters, stored in the bladder, then you're ready to eliminate or void your bladder, urinate, the blood leaves the, through the urethra and goes outside. Okay. Reproduction, obviously there's a difference between boys and girls. So you have a male reproductive system, a female reproductive system. In the male you have your, uh, your penis, testes, scrotum, uh, prostate. Females includes the breast, the mammary glands in the breast, uterus, vagina, ovaries. Uh, uterine tube, also known as the fallopian tube. Um, their main goal is to uh, make an egg, make sperm, and during uh, coitus or copulation, sperm and egg come together and you, you reproduce a human being or another animal if you're not a human being. Um, they also have an important endocrine function. They also make hormones. So your sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, testosterone in guys, estrogen in girls, um, those are made in the testes and the ovaries. Okay, so all these systems have to work together, okay? None of our systems work independently. We, we're, they're all interrelated, they all work together. Um, it's really hard to survive missing an organ system, okay? We have found ways to, to do that. Um, in some cases, you, you can't make it without a nervous system. Um, if you were to lose your heart, like in, you know, if they've got artificial hearts, but you still have to have a heart, it may be artificial. Um, if you have kidney failure, you, you may be able to go on dialysis, which, which is an artificial kidney, but you still have to have that function. Um, there's very few things that you can actually live without. You've got to either have, um, either have that actual organ or some, um, some um, mechanical or uh, alternative way to do that. So you have to have, uh, have, to have these organs. Um, for example, right now, you're using your respiratory system, you're breathing. You're using your digestive system if you've just eaten a meal. You're using your urinary system to make urine and get rid of waste. You're controlling your body temperature. You're using your brain. You're taking notes. All this is going on at the same time. Um, this is kind of a, a really neat slide just to kind of show you how all these things work together. Um, just kind of shows you where everything's going and how everything's uh, kind of coming together. It's in your book. Um, say you have food or water. Water enters into the digestive system. As it goes into the small intestine, anything, water or nutrients, whatever, it's absorbed into the bloodstream. The waste, whatever's left over, you know, think about eating corn. You guys know what I'm talking about. If you eat corn, there's always some little extra corn left. So whatever waste comes out, goes out into the feces. Sometimes you have diarrhea, there's water in there. If you're constipated, there's very little water. Um, the nutrients, the water goes into the blood. It's then circulated through the body. Okay, it goes to the heart. From the heart, it goes to the lungs to pick up oxygen or to dump off carbon dioxide, which is a waste product. You take that oxygen and those nutrients out to the body so those nutrients can go out to the cells. 
You filter the water or the, <clears throat> the blood through the um, kidneys to get rid of excess water, and that goes out into urine. So lots of things going on. We're exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide all the time. We're eating, we're drinking all the time. Uh, we're exchanging nutrients into our bloodstream, and then when the blood goes out to the cell level, out to your muscle tissue, out to your nervous, wherever it needs to go, your brain. You have to have nutri uh, nutrients in your brain. It will exchange those at its target. Oh, and go back. This this thing, that's your integumentary system. That holds us all together. Okay, that's our boundary. All right, so now we have all that stuff. We have these organ systems. Um, what do we have to have to make that be alive, okay, in order to have life? Uh, so we have all this stuff, but it's, if, if, what does it mean to be alive or dead, basically? Uh, and you have to have boundaries, okay? Uh, and not only that, that separates you from the outside world, so for example, my skin, but you also have, also have to have boundaries um, for each organ or between cells. Think about a red blood cell, okay? It's, it's not just out there like that. There's actually a cell membrane that holds it together. Your heart, I know your heart doesn't look like this, but you know that's the shape of a heart that we recognize. It has a boundary. Uh, you have to have movement, and not just uh, st movement from you know walking around or jumping up and down of your body, but things throughout your body, like blood, food, things like that have to move throughout your body. You have to respond, and not only do you have to uh, you have to be able to sense it, you have to respond to it. So, for example, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you sense that it's hot, and you respond by withdrawing your hand. Um, if you start to run and all of a sudden you're like, man, you get out of breath, <laughs> you need more oxygen, uh, you respond by breathing faster, breathing harder. You have to be able to digest. Okay, when you eat something, uh, you know, I can eat a big piece of steak, but my cells can do nothing with a big piece of steak. That has to be broken down to its cell components, its chemical components for my cells to use it. So you have to break down uh, food. And then you have to be able to absorb it. So your stomach, you break down this stuff, break down a steak, and your small intestine, absorbs it and then it goes into the bloodstream so that your cells can use it. You have to have metabolism and that basically means you have to break things down and build things back up. Uh, the two words you're going to use, these are all chemical reactions, you can use the word catabolism and anabolism. Uh, catabolic reaction breaks things down, for example when you eat a steak you break it down to the proteins. Uh, in anabolism, you build things back up. So, for example, if I ate the steak and I broke it down to its component proteins and amino acids, my body would then take those amino acids and put them back together and build muscle for me. So you're basically breaking things down and building things back up. You've probably heard of anabolic steroids. Those build muscle. You have to be able to excrete stuff. Get rid of the, get rid of the bad stuff, okay? Things like urea, carbon dioxide, uh, feces, things like that got to reproduce and not just a baby not just making offspring but growth and repair making more blood cells making more skin cells um, as you grow you've got to make more bone so all these things are as reproduction cellular reproduction and you got to grow you got to grow you have an egg you have a sperm you've got to have a growth process in order to become a fully formed organism now you have all that how do you survive to survive, you have to have food, okay? You've got to have those nutrients, those basic chemicals that allow your body to work. Things like sugars, which we call carbohydrates, lipids, which are fats, proteins, minerals uh, like zinc, uh, calcium, uh, iron, vitamins like vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin B. Uh, and you get all that from your digestive system. You have to have oxygen. You have to be able to have oxygen. And the reason we have to have oxygen is oxygen is a key component in making what's called ATP. And ATP is the actual molecule that our body uses for energy. It's the molecule that allows us to do work. And you can't make ATP without oxygen. You have to have water. Water is the most abundant chemical in your body. You know, you're somewhere between 60 and 80 percent water. All your chemical reactions uh, work in water. They work perfectly in water, so you've got to have it. And you get that from um, food and uh, 
drinking. And also it's a byproduct. There's some chemical reactions going on in your body, especially respiration. Think about on a cold day, when you breathe out, you fog up your, your uh, glasses or fog up the window, that's water vapor. So you actually make water inside your lungs. Uh, you have to have a normal body temperature, okay? Uh, all, all of our body functions work best at 98.6, and we work okay somewhere between about 92 and about 104. 94 to about a 10 degree range. 94 to 104 is, you know, that's kind of optimal. Uh, anytime you get a, below that temperature, um, things slow down. Think about, um, think about if you took a, p a piece of butter, all right, and it's perfect. It's a perfect pat of butter, square piece of butter. If it gets really, really cold, okay, or let's say, let's go the other way. Let's say you start to heat that up and it melts, okay. Uh, it's not really that good anymore. You can't, you can't, if it's all melted and it's liquid, you can't use your knife to, melt, to spread it on a piece of toast anymore. Um, but if you start to bring the temperature back down, it'll start to recongeal and it'll become butter. But if you get it too cold, it gets really, really hard and you still can't spread it on, on toast. So at room temperature is perfect. If it's too hot, it's just, it's just melted and you can't do anything with it. If it's too cold, it's too hard. Same thing in our bodies. So our bodies need to be at a perfect temperature for things to work. And you've got to have the right atmospheric pressure. Um, that's why when you go up in an airplane to 36,000 feet, they pressurize the airplane to about 8,000 feet, which humans can live in. That's about the same height as a, a you know about a good-sized mountain in the Rockies. Um, and so you can exchange gases. If you go too high, there's not enough atmospheric pressure there, and you can exchange gases. If you've ever been to the Rockies, you know that's true because if you go to 10,000 feet, 14,000 feet, <gasps> you can't breathe. It takes a lot more effort to exchange those gases. Okay, key concept, homeostasis. You got to know this. This is something we're going to talk about from here on out, 201, 202. What does it mean? It's to maintain a stable environment, okay, despite changes. So you can add, it's to maintain this stable environment Okay, by responding to change. Okay, so for example, I want my body temperature to be 98.6. As this room gets cold, my body responds by shivering to bring my body temperature back up. So although my body temperature changed, it dropped just a little bit, my body recognized that and responded and caused me to shiver to bring it back up. That's homeostasis. And your body does this all the time. It's responding to changes in blood pressure, changes in respiration rate, heart rate, blood sugar. Um, so like I said, it's not that you're just staying the same. You do have some slight changes, but you bring them back to normal. So they may go up, you bring them back down. They may go down, you bring them back up. Um, you have to have some kind of way to monitor that. Uh, typically, it's involved in your nervous system. It's kind of the is kind of the monitoring or control center, and then it will send out the correct response. Your endocrine system also plays a large role in maintaining homeostasis, especially things like blood sugar and uh, urine output, things like that. All right, so how does this work? Um, you have to have a receptor, you have to have a control center, you have to have an effector. Uh, an effector is basically what, what responds. It's usually an organ or a muscle or a gland. So a sensor, like might be a touch receptor, might be a cold receptor, it might be a blood sugar receptor, it might be a blood pressure receptor. Somewhere in your body you have these receptors. Control center is usually the brain. And Depending, it could be the endocrine system. Could be your thyroid or your pituitary, something like that. So you have, you get, uh, you, you sense something, there's some change. Your brain or your endocrine system responds to that change and sends out the response to either an organ, a muscle, or a gland to do something. So let's just kind of do that as a schematic. So this is where I want to be. I want to be in balance. I want to be in homeostasis. I want to stay relatively stable. So there's some kind of stimulus. It causes me to get out of balance. My receptor picks that up, it detects it, and it sends a signal to the control center. Again, either the nervous system or the endocrine system. 
okay? It then sends the response or the output, the response, to the effector. Again, an organ, a gland, a tissue, it puts you back in balance. Now that happens in two ways, either negative feedback or positive feedback. Negative feedback is when the response shuts off the original signal. And I would say 99% of all homeostatic mechanisms work by negative feedback. There's just a few examples of what's called positive feedback. Nervous uh, body temperature is a negative feedback. Uh, blood volume is negative feedback. Blood pressure is negative feedback. Blood sugar levels are negative feedback. So let's look at the, how that works. I'm going to use temperature again. It's the easiest one to understand. All right, so here's where you want to be, okay? In this case, the stimulus is going to be hot. You're getting hot. You have receptors in your skin saying, we're getting hot. They send that signal to the brain. The brain sends information to the sweat glands, the gland. The gland, sweat glands sweat. That water sweat comes to the surface of your skin, evaporates, and you cool down, okay? That stimulus, your body temperature is dropping. So you're shutting off that this this, uh, you're, you're now lowering your body temperature. So that's now shutting off. It's opposite of the hot. It's shutting that down. So now, what if you sweated too much? Have you ever gotten really, really hot and sweated a lot, and all of a sudden you kind of got cold? <laughs> you sweated too much. You brought your body temperature too far down. Now you're out of balance again. So your skin said, okay, we overdid it. It's too cold. Send a signal to the brain. Now the brain sends a signal to your muscles to shiver to try to bring you back up. So now this cold stimulus is being shut off by generating heat. Um, this, this is another example. Blood pressure does the same thing. You have uh, changes in blood pressure, send signals to the hypothalamus, which is in your brain. It actually releases a hormone. So this is endocrine system and neurosystem working together. And they tell the kidneys to save water. It's called, this is called antidiuretic hormone, uh, which basically means you don't make as much urine, so you conserve water. And so that brings your blood pressure back up. So this is just a good example of the nervous system and the endocrine system working together. And you'll see that more uh, later in 202. Now, positive feedback is where you don't shut off the original stimulus. Okay, you go and you actually make the original stimulus stronger. Okay, you, you enhance that original stimulus, actually amplifies it. And the two times you typically see that are in labor and delivery and in blood clotting. Uh, and so, let's see what I've got a slide of. I've got blood flow. Let me go back. Think about this one to me kind of is the easiest one, for, especially for women to understand. Um, think about if you've ever had a baby or you know someone that's had a baby. Uh, you're 40 weeks, it's time to, 36 weeks to 40 weeks, it's time to have the baby. One night you wake up and there's a contraction, okay? Uh, we're like, okay, what's going on? Maybe an hour later, there's another contraction. And then maybe 45 minutes, and 30 minutes. And you'll notice, actually, make a bigger C, these are getting stronger and more close together until finally it's ready to be, the baby's ready to be born. What's happening is every time you contract, that sends a signal to the brain. The brain recognizes that as it's time to deliver the baby. And it sends out a hormone that uses the endocrine system as well called oxytocin. And oxytocin is a hormone released in the blood, goes to the uterus, and causes it to contract harder. So now you've got a harder contraction. The brain picks that up, sends out more, makes the endocrine system send out more oxytocin. Oxytocin makes the uterus contract harder. So that's a harder contraction, it's a bigger stimulus, makes you send out more oxytocin. A bigger contraction makes you have more oxytocin. And so it just keeps coming round and round and round and round until finally you have a really close together big contractions. Because you don't want to stop that. You want to get that baby out. So it's positive feedback. It just keeps feeding on itself and making the original stimulus stronger and more effective. Blood clotting is the same way. If you were to cut yourself, you don't want to bleed to death, okay? So if you break, if you cut yourself and uh, the, the, the blood comes out, <laughs> you bleed, all right? That starts a cascade where basically platelets start to adhere to themselves, okay? 
And the more platelets are out there, the more chemicals are released, the more platelets come in, the more chemicals are released, the more platelets come in, and you form a blood clot. And it's real fast, real effective, because you wouldn't want to stop that. You wouldn't want to keep bleeding. You want to have that be um, more platelets uh, to block that blood. So labor and delivery and blood clotting are your pretty much your only positive feedback mechanisms. All right, um, homeostatic imbalance, that's what we call disease. All right, that's usually when something's gone wrong. When you can no longer maintain a homeostatic balance, that's when you're at risk of diseases. Uh, and these tend to increase as you get older. Um, for example, if you've gone to your grandmother's house and she is always cold, the house, the temperature in the room is 104 degrees and you know, but she's sitting there with a blanket on. It's because she can no longer regulate her body temperature. Her homeostatic mechanisms aren't really working anymore. Um, people who are in renal failure, they can't maintain balance anymore. If you tend to be diabetic, uh, it means you have a high blood, pressure, uh, blood sugar. That means your pancreas isn't responding anymore like it should. So you're, not, you're no longer able to maintain a constant blood sugar. So typically when these things go, um, when your homeostasis doesn't, doesn't work anymore, uh, that usually leads to some sort of disease process. And we'll learn about those. We'll talk about those as we go along. Okay, I think that's the end of this lecture. And um, I'm going to keep going. I'll start another video, and we'll do lecture two. And I'll see you in just a minute.